Driving in Italy. It's something many Americans wouldn't consider doing. They've heard stories about crazy Italian drivers. They've heard that mass transit's the way to go. Renting a car is too expensive. The gas is too expensive. It doesn't make sense to, to do it. Like many of the things you hear about Italy, it just isn't true. I just returned from a trip where we drove 1,400 miles. It's 2,300 kilometers all across Italy. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about why you should consider renting a car if you're going to go to Italy. I wouldn't go any other way. Also, we're going to talk about toll booths and how to correctly navigate those as well as buying gasoline there. I'm also going to give you some advice in general about our experience traveling there. Now, I need to mention we made a decision not to drive in any of the major cities. No Rome, no Venice, no Florence, no Pisa. There was never any doubt that I was going to drive in Italy. The town that my grandfather herded sheep in in the early 1900s is San Pietro in Garano. It's a small town of about 3,600 people. It's in the Calabria region. And really, the only way to get there sensibly is by car. I wanted to see this landscape where my grandfather had grown up in prior to re-immigrating back in the United States. It's a place where my father had ventured, my uncles had gone there, and they told me it was something I needed to see. If you're considering renting a car there, there's going to be a couple things you're going to need. One's going to be this. That's International Driver's License. You can pick that up at any AAA. It's not very difficult. Just go in with your regular driver's license from whatever state you reside in. They'll get one for you in short order. The other thing is you're going to need a rental car. Now, we picked one up from Europe Car. They're a European rental company. It's just similar to Hertz or Avis or any of the ones you're familiar with around here. Both places where I picked one up and I dropped it off at a different location, both places were very accommodating. There were people there that spoke English. That made it very easy. And they were very easy to deal with. As far as a rental car, I wanted something small. I knew some of the streets were, you know, 1,500, 2,000 years old. They're rather narrow. The car we ended up with was a Fiat 500 hybrid. Didn't necessarily want the hybrid part. What that meant is we've got a 70 horsepower engine and a battery underneath. It's more of a city car. The battery charges up as you go down hills or break. And when the battery charges, the car's fine. On extended drives, though, the battery starts to run down. You've got 70 horsepower and that's all you got. We rented the car for 12 days. It had unlimited mileage so we could go as far as we wanted. It cost us $447. That includes the insurance. So when you rent a car in Europe, the insurance is tacked onto your price right up front. Currently, the euro is equal to the US dollar, about equal to the US dollar. So you kind of know your cost going in. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. My first drive in Italy would take us out of the center of Sorrento and have us drive along the Amalfi Coast through Salerno. The first thing you learn in Italy is you always need to keep your eyes on the road in front of you and in all your mirrors. Your head needs to be on a swivel. You need to pay attention. Anyone can and will pass you at any time. Scooters and motorcycles pass whenever they see the smallest opportunity. People walk out into the streets constantly. Most intersections are roundabouts and most of the locals consider the smallest gap a chance not to yield. When you get to the coast, you need not to have a fear of heights because it looks well like this. I don't want to scare anyone here. My first day behind the wheel was also the most intimidating and yet I realized I wasn't all that intimidated. You learn to pay attention to everything around you quickly and soon you realize that everyone else is also paying close attention and in many ways that's a good thing. Drivers there very rarely hold anyone up. They will pull out of the way and let you pass. You give scooters and motorcycles room to pass. You actively scan for pedestrians and this all works out. We used Google Maps to navigate a pre-planned route each day and that made things much easier. We make our way to Pestum. Pestum was a major ancient Greek city on the coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea. The ruins of Pestum are famous for their three ancient Greek temples in the Doric order. They date from about 550 to 450 BC and they are in an excellent state of preservation. This is day 12 of our trip and for the first time we are not surrounded by other tourists. There are a few who arrive by bus but only a few. We park the car and leave our luggage in the car as we explore the ruins. Leaving the luggage in the car is a huge relief. You see we had taken trains thus far on our trip from the Rome airport to Venice and then back to Rome and then from Rome to Sorrento, each time dragging our luggage from place to place. When you're traveling by train, the first thing you do when you get anywhere is take the time to drag and ditch your luggage at your hotel. In the rental, this was no longer a concern. This day and really the rest of the time we are in the car, we can explore at our own pace, go whenever we like, wherever we like, and we are not hindered by train schedules or having luggage. 
We make our way to our Airbnb for the evening, back the car up right to the front door, unload our luggage just a few feet into our room. We drive to the Calypso Restaurante Pizzeria, and we dine on pizza with a view of the Trinian Sea that's a good ending to the day. The following day, we drive through the mountains, and I mean that in a very literal sense. We drive through tunnels, which lead to bridges, that lead to tunnels, that lead to bridges, that lead to more tunnels. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and in Italy, they consider distance vertically. This means they avoid building switchbacks on the main roads. Once again, a bit different from what I'm used to in the States, but not intimidating. We make our way through Rendi and on to Strada Provinciale 229. This is a road that leads to San Pietro and Garano. This is not a major road. It is narrow, steep at times, with many switchbacks. These are the type of roads that could be somewhat concerning for some drivers. That said, most of this type of road can be avoided most of the time. We make our way into town and get to a point where we have to park the car. This is a very old city, and all but one of the streets here, and specifically the one I'm looking for, are walking paths. We walk about five minutes and there it is, the only street in the world with my family's namesake, Via Intrieri. I'm in a place where my ancestors had lived for untold years. I feel like I've accomplished what I needed to do in Italy, and that everything from this point forward would be a bonus. We spend some time walking around the city and eventually return to Rendi for the evening. It was at this point that we were going to need to get gas. This was something that concerned us prior to renting a car, and it really shouldn't have been. Many gas stations in Italy have full service pumps. You simply hand over your credit card and an employee fills your tank. It's a few cents more, but it's really easy. We use these most often. There are also service stations with no employees. They're self-service. We use these as well. The one thing you need to be aware of when using a self-service pump is the language button when you first approach the pump. If you speak English, simply look for the English flag. That would be the flag of the United Kingdom. Once you hit that button, all all the instructions are in English and very simple to follow. Most self-service stations will take a credit card or they can take euros, just like an ATM. You feed the euros in, you get that amount of gas. So it's best to have both on you. The English button will also be found at all toll booths, and there is no doubt you will see toll booths on Italian highways. Just look for the language button before you do anything, select the appropriate language, and follow the instructions. Many times these instructions will both be verbal and in print, and if you hit the English language, it's going to talk to you in English. Normally you just insert your ticket, then the credit card or euros, and you move along. The following day we head towards Matera along the Ionian Sea coast, first back through the mountains and eventually along the coast. We stop at two separate museums, both featured uncovered city ruins and hundreds of thousands of items that were excavated and restored for display. Both places were empty, excluding the two of us, and one place had an employee walk with us through the massive rooms so he could turn the lights on as we went. This is something you wouldn't see on a tour bus, I wouldn't think, and rail really doesn't get that far down. This path took us on long stretches of highway, and you can drive highways in Italy with ease. The only thing you really need to do is check your mirrors prior to making a pass. Speeds on the highway vary greatly, and the speed limit seems to be a suggestion that only most large trucks follow and a few of the older population. Everyone else there goes their own pace. For those of you that like to camp out in the passing lane, this is a definite no-no in Italy. One simply does not do that here. You make your pass quickly and move back over to the right lane or the traveling lane. This is something I miss about driving in Italy, as I encounter multiple people every single day in the United States that think they can ride in the passing lane if they are going the speed limit. I think most people in Italy know not to inconvenience other drivers, whereas Americans many times kind of think of themselves. We drive into Matera, and I mean right through the center of the old city. This is a city that's been continually inhabited for over 15,000 years. The streets were designed for horses and mules. It's at this point that I'm really glad we're driving a tiny Fiat. This is a beautiful city where we spend the next couple of days. We drop our luggage off at the hotel. I drive back out of the city to a local parking garage. It costs us $12 a day to park there. We leave Matera, and we are back on the back roads of the country. It's at this point I need to tell you that you will not see many red lights or stop signs. We only encountered three red lights over our entire trip and maybe five to six stop signs. What you do encounter a lot of are roundabouts. I have absolutely no idea how many roundabouts we went through, but I would think it was five to six hundred plus. These are very well constructed with very good lines of sight. You can see if anyone else is in the roundabout long before you enter. Of the 500 or so that we encounter, I would guess that we only had a yield 10, 15 times maybe, as you could pace your entry either slower or faster to allow you to continue to move without stopping. This is something too I wish we had more of in the States. We drive through Trulli di Arobello and on to Astuni, both of which offer unique and different styles of architecture. We walk through both cities for a brief time and then head north along the Adriatic Sea. Once again, we are on Italian highways for long stretches. 
Our destination for the evening was the city of Vesti. This requires us to exit the highway and drive along SS89 to Strada Provinciale Matinata Vesti. Now, I know I didn't pronounce that correctly, so I apologize to any Italians that might see this. But this road is just awesome. It hugs the coast of the Gulf of Manfredonia with elevation changes that provide great views of white cliff faces. There are several overlooks along the way prior to entering the city. We stay at a property just north of the city. It provides us with a private beach, a balcony overlooking the ocean, and the city itself. This city is mostly vacant of tourists, and I would return here for an extended period of time in a minute. A car rally drove through the town that evening on the public streets, which is a very different experience for me. It was fun, but different. The following day had us traveling to Tivoli, which is about 30 kilometers west of Rome. I mentioned earlier that I decided not to drive into larger cities before we arrived. I think that was a sound decision for our first time in the country, but this was relatively close to Rome, so I didn't know what to expect. As it turns out, there was nothing to worry about at all. It was the same type of freeway we had experienced so far on our trip. We check into a castle from the evening, it was from the 1500s. It was just outside Hadrian's Villa, and take a tour of the ground for a few hours. This was a very impressive stop for us. The following morning we were back on the road, and our destination that day was Civita di Bagnornio, but we detour a bit to Saleno which is described as a ghost town, and it lives up to its description. There's a small museum and a clock tower, which a gentleman opens up for us. Once again, there are only a couple other people in the entire town. This is something that was nice about the rental. We had become comfortable, so we could branch out and explore. We make the drive through the countryside to Civita di Bagnornio. This is where we're staying for the next couple of days. It was the home of St. Bonaventure. It's another kind of ghost town up on a hill. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. All the original architecture is untouched or restored. This makes a great place for us to unwind as we see the entire city in a couple of hours so you kind of get to poke around and talk to the locals our last driving day would be to return the rental car in senna driving in italy at this point is simple it's easy we filled the fuel tank a little fee out a few miles away from the drop-off location the drop-off was also simple the company representative walks around the car checks the mileage and is kind enough to call us a cab to the railway station and that's it our time behind the wheel is over. At the train station, we wait at the announced platform for the train, which is now running 10 minutes late. Five minutes before it pulls into the station, there's an announcement that the platform has been changed. The new platform is three tracks away, so we carry our luggage downstairs in a rush under the tracks and upstairs again to the now correct platform. We board the train, store our luggage in the overhead bin, and begin the trek to Pisa. It's during this train ride that I realized just how much of the countryside we are missing by taking a train. It rides through tunnels and ditches most of the way to our destination. This feeling of loss is only confirmed when we arrive at the train station in Pisa and now have to walk seven blocks to our Airbnb we have rented. The train station and the surrounding streets are jammed with people, the sidewalks are rough to wheel luggage across, and tonight, for the first time in 12 days, we are restricted to visiting places that we can either walk to or take a cab. We hit all the tourist locations in Pisa, and of course, they're jammed with people, and we travel by train to Florence, which is more the same. There's much to see in both these cities. If you can tolerate the crowds, and I don't regret seeing these places, however, when someone asked me what was my favorite part of my time in Italy, the answer is the southern and middle part of the country. Driving there is undoubtedly my favorite part of the trip. The entire country has history around it in every corner. You don't have to look far to find something beautiful or amazing. The next time we go to Italy, I will have a route mapped out for every day we spend in the country. That route will skip every major city. Upon landing, I will go directly to a Europe car rental location and grab whatever fiat they have in inventory, and we'll be on our way. We will seek out sites that are less traveled and enjoy them at our own pace away from the crowds. Just some quick general pieces of advice. If you have a fear of driving in Italy, just don't. If you're a decent driver in the States, you're going to do fine in Italy. You'll adjust quickly to what's going on over there. Maybe familiarize yourself with some of the road signs. That would be helpful prior to going. That's something I didn't do, but maybe you should. You're going to see the major cities, but when you do so, do it during the week. Go Monday through Friday. On the weekends, venture out in the country. You're going to avoid the crowds that way, regardless of whether you go. If you go in on season, it's going to be crowded anyway. But during the weekdays, they'll be less crowded than they would be on the weekends. Also, visit the big cities. They have a lot to offer. Rome, Florence, Pisa. We saw all of those cities, and there's a lot there. It's just, you know, crowded. One of the last things I have to say is congratulations to Rachel and Kevin. It's my oldest daughter. She got married to my now son-in-law, Kevin. That was the reason for our trip in the first place. They were getting married in Rome. We needed to attend. Thanks for coming along on our trip. If I helped you out there, if there's a little bit of advice, something you picked up, please consider subscribing. That would certainly be appreciated. Until next time, we'll see you.